Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and friends, my name is Andreas Esch and I'm the director of Bertelsmann Stiftung's Megatrans program. I'd like to welcome you uh, to our webinar on WTO reform this afternoon, at least for the Europeans. Um, today, there seems to be just one topic left. So, my question is, why should we be interested in uh, the WTO in the middle of COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, trade is actually front and center in the current crisis, and globalization might be amongst the first victims of COVID-19. We are currently seeing a range of trade measures being introduced in the wake of the crisis. Many countries have imposed export bans, not only on medical equipment, but also on food. It is not only not helpful, but it risks aggravating the human cost of the crisis. Most importantly, it's also very short-sighted. In the supply chain world, things are made in the world, including ventilators. And if ventilators parts can no longer be assembled into final products, that's bad news for the patients. It's no longer beggar thy neighbor, it is now sicken your neighbor and yourself. In the second step, these measures risk provoking the reaction that production needs to be brought home ultimately putting an end to globalization as we know. Bertelsmann Stiftung continues to believe in rules-based globalization for the sake of everyone. Not only because it's economically efficient, but also because we believe that in trade, as in other matters, it's preferable to find solutions for global problems to engagement, negotiation, and collaboration among stakeholders, not unilateral short-termist action. WTO is precisely the forum to facilitate an exchange. It is the core, so to speak, the element of the core, the kernel of the operating system of the world economy, a global public good of utmost importance and in dire need of an update. Now more than ever, it is time to provide the institution with a much needed update so it can deliver once it is needed for underpinning a global recovery after this crisis. If there is no faith in a global rules-based order, from this crisis a very different kind of global economy might emerge. It could be a doggy dog world, strongly adversarial and transactional nation states dominated by geostrategic interest only, trade wars, and the survival of the mighty. It would provide much less opportunity for freedom and development, but for anger and ultimately aggression. Enough now of gloomy outlooks. Let's focus on the opportunities at hand, but that's not for me to do it. Therefore, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Christian Blut, who is heading our trade initiatives. He will say a few words before leading us to the seminar and to the webinar. Christian. Yes, thank you very much, Andreas. So um, my task today is to uh, basically be the master of ceremonies and to moderate this event. The main task is that we hear from uh, the authors of recent papers that the Global Economic Dynamic Project has published. So um, let me run quickly through the project as such and uh, through uh, the papers um, that we've recently published and the order in which we're going to do this. So this is what I uh, should have put up from the beginning um, the slides that were supposed to go uh, with our webinar. And what we are going to do today, uh, let me jump here slightly, uh, is um, that we are going to talk about four things. We are going to talk first about uh, dispute settlement, where Petros Mavroides is giving us a brief introduction. Mm -hmm. um, then about working practices, about open plurilateral agreements, and industrial subsidies. For each of these blocks, we'll take about 10 minutes, which will be followed by, um, um, which will be followed by a Q&A on each of these sections. So if all goes well, we should be done in an hour and a half, thereabouts, and I'll try to do my best to keep um, ships running on time. Um, just as a general point, um, this is sort of the second phase of our project on WTO reform. 
The first project phase culminated in a report that was uh, written by Bernard, but that uh, is, is based on deliberations of a high-level expert board, which we published in summer 2018, and which still serves as the backdrop to uh, these more detailed um, reform proposals that we are now articulating in this second project phase. Um, we believe that, as Andreas has already outlined, um, the WTO is a vital public good. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but it's probably more vital than ever that this uh, operating system of the world economy receives an update um, because only if there is trust in the global trading system and trade costs can be persistently kept low, then the global um, trading system can help the recovery that will be much needed after the COVID-19 crisis. If you want to find information about our project, you can find that on our website, uh, gddproject.com. You can follow GetTweet, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do through the website. Just after this session, we are going to publish a blog post on the website that will feature a recording of this event if you want to go back to individual elements. But it will also contain the links to all the papers that we are going to mention. So this will be the one single access space uh, for all the papers. Um, just one element, really, that I wanted to share with you before we jump into the middle of things. What we have also done for a couple of years now is a survey amongst people in the world about their views on trade and globalization. And we've just had the uh, numbers for 2020. And uh, as you can see, people continue to believe uh, that the WTO is an important organization. That's the big uh, numbers that you see on the left. And actually there seems to be, if anything, an increase in realizing the relevance of the WTO. So um, that's, that's a very encouraging sign, I think. And with that encouraging sign, um, I uh, yield the floor to Petros, who's going to start the first section of this webinar. Petros, the floor is yours. So. My okay. God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. we can hear you. So I was asked to speak a little bit about dispute settlement. Uh, I will refer, I will use two papers we did with Bernard on dispute settlement, uh, in which we have posted on the EUI webpage. The first paper I will mention briefly because I want you to understand the background. The first paper asks one question, to what extent the dispute settlement crisis is self-contained or to what extent there is an overlap between the crisis of the WTO and the dispute settlement crisis. And our response is that you cannot dissociate the two in the medium to long run, as uh, the legislative function of the WTO is waning and waxing over time, you would expect to see fewer and fewer disputes. And there are some, there are some early signs to this effect if you look at the overall numbers, but also, and that's the most important part, if you look into the FTAs that are being signed nowadays, many of the FTAs, actually more and more of the FTAs, contain dispute settlement provisions, which was not necessarily the case, essentially, was, as far as Europe was concerned before. Now the Court of Justice has to ask the question, what do I do with a dispute settlement in, the, for example, the Canada or the Singapore FTA? The second paper, which is where I will focus, asks the question, well, I mean, what how have we dealt essentially, I mean, to go into the reasons for the crisis, which is a never ending story. How have we dealt with Apple at body crisis so far? And is this the first best way to continue uh, addressing the question? So in our view, for whatever our view is worth, I mean, we start with a first commonplace uh, observation, the Apple at body doesn't exist. There is uncertainty as to what to do nowadays with uh, a, cases, there are 11 cases where panel reports have been issued. They are pending before the appellate body, God knows. Uh, they cannot actually deal with them because it's not just one member. So we don't know what is the fate of those cases. We don't know what is the fate of cases which will be appealed in the near future to the void. 
and so on and so forth. So what do we observe as a stopgap solution? The EU-led initiative, you have some sort of, uh, from now on, for um, uh, ad hoc, let's say, appellate body for their disputes. But again, this to us is very far away from an optimal solution. If at all, it creates a two-tier system where the EU and the acolytes will have a, uh, an ad hoc appellate body, the rest of the world will not on essentially the same issues because they both will be asking WTO interpretation of the WTO contract. Now, with this in mind, with a, that is, with a, so keeping in mind that the stopgap solutions have not, in our view, addressed the, the problem, we're looking to what happened in the WTO. Now, if you go into the WTO and you take one, st one step back from um, uh, the advent of the DSU onwards, what we observe is people were mindful that this is a new system, it's trial and error, we have to keep in mind that things can go wrong, not necessarily already, but wrong. So what do about it? Well, what do about it is an embedded sort of uh, review of the system, the DSU review. Now the DSU review, if you look at it, has been by any reasonable account a huge failure. The biggest issues that were plaguing the WTO dispute settlement actually were not discussed or were discussed in a very subliminal manner. But anyway, no matter what the depth of discussions was, there was no solution at all. I mean, uh, in the papers we take, we go through the whole list. I can give you a couple of examples. Uh, already two years, 20 years ago, Chile and the US table a paper saying, we think the Apple body has started overreaching, blah, 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 blah. What happens to this? Nothing. The European Union says, well, maybe one way to deal with the problem is we will always need the court. It's impossible to write in complete code. Maybe we should go for better judges. Let's go for permanent panelists within a couple of years. When they got no backing from anyone, they dropped the proposal and so on and so forth. Now, this could be the case because of uh, um, consensus or they didn't take it seriously enough, all sorts of, this is irrelevant. The DSU review after 20 something, 22 years now, we can definitely conclude it has failed. So maybe there are two things that we care about in this, and with these two things, I will stop. The first is where do we, Bernard and me, if we were the drafters, what would we do, what would be our priority, let's say items. And the second is how can we make sure these priority items will find their way in the new DSU. Now on the first point, we think that unfortunately, neither the DSU review, definitely not the DSU, have thought seriously about the institutional aspects of dispute settlement. It's one thing to write, uh, I take the cases, negative consensus and so on. But the key thing here is who will be the judge for those cases. These are very, very demanding agreements, intellectually very challenging. I mean, if you look at the European Court of Justice case law or the US Commerce Clause case law on issues like public health protection, environmental protection, and so on, they're all over the place, black, white, and gray, not because these guys are stupid, far from it. But these are very demanding questions. You talk about essentially cases of asymmetric information where you request from the judge to understand what the intent behind the particular measure with trade effects, because all measures have a trade effect is, my God, I mean, these are demanding issues. Who, who will take care of the, who, forget who will, who has taken care of this? Well, who has taken care of this when we do typecasting and we look and quiz your uh, uh, regression to the mean panelist, quite frankly, it's a first year appointment in Geneva with absolutely no, uh, um, a demonstrate demonstrable expertise in trade issues, neither law nor economics, and so on and so forth. So our, unsurprisingly, our proposals focus much, much more on the institutional dimension. We would like, for example, one, to have some sort of the A team by any WTO member appointed as judges at the WTO. We're big fans of permanent panelists. We cannot go on with people who are served as uh, ambassadors or whatever who are loaded guns, many of them, met, also many of them have absolutely no idea about what's going on and then ask the secretariat, which changes every three, four, five years to draft the reports. 
this has to change. And we, we would like to see responsible courts with uh, serious members, with institutional guarantees, and to make them even more responsible, we'd like them to appoint their own clerks. We'd like those people to come up with their clerks. They should not be relying on WTO um, um, personnel, which might be conflicted. I mean, everybody speaks about impartiality for years in the WTO, never about independence, but the independence has to be from the Secretariat. I cannot be advising if I'm a member of the Secretariat today, Cameroon on an issue and tomorrow be advising the panel on the issue where I advised Cameroon. I mean, these things cannot just, this cannot go on forever. It has to stop here. So institutional guarantees for the people and expertise, both. Now to help expertise, we like very much a European institution this Article 255 committee, whereby there is some sort of screening of uh, judges before they are appointed. So we reduce the incentive to appoint guys who will be apparatchiks or uh, the voice of the master, make sure that at least those guys have, they, they speak the language of expertise more than anything else. The second point we want to make in this, um, uh, in this context is better resource, better use of the WTO resources. If, if you open any agreement from anti-dumping to you name it, you discuss issues like causality. Uh, how, what caused, uh, what caused injury to the domestic industry? I mean, how on earth can you do those things unless if you are a serious econometrician? You have to understand that these are not things you can write by saying, by inferring causality, by confusing causality with all sorts of other uh, intellectually, let's say, related the concepts and so on. We would like to see a WTO where dispute settlement will be functionally aided by serious economics expertise. This is an economics contract. We cannot continue to keep asking uh, economists just to quantify countermeasures as is the current practice in the WTO. And the third uh, point and the last point that uh, we make in this paper concerns the attitude of, of, uh, of the judges towards I mean, if you wish, the way they understand their competence. I, uh, I find it surprising that nobody has raised before the question of, they call it, they use a Latin term non-liquid. What do you do if you don't have enough law or if law can seriously be interpreted in two or three different ways? Is it for the judge to choose? We take the, people make this assumption, oh, the judge can pick. Why? Why should the judge pick one of two or three possible interpretations and not turn the ball back to uh, the legislative function and say, you guys, you have to tell me what you want to do here. The way I look at the record, I can understand that this can be interpreted A, B, C, or D. I am not the guy who should be that. I'm not the legislator. I am a judge. You tell me what you want to do in case in some, there are obvious examples from zero to you name it, uh, where they should throw the ball back to the left and have some sort of osmosis in the sense, better, better connection, with connectivity between the judiciary and the legislative function of the WTO. Now, how go about it, I'll say very briefly. You see, consensus, of course, we understand consensus is a problem, but it's very difficult to do away with consensus. Uh, it is very, I mean, as much as Bernard and I like uh, uh, plurilateral agreements, we like them if when we discuss substantive issues, not when we discuss procedural issues, like dispute settlement, where essentially all 164 members will be uh, eventually concerned. So we would, we would like a little bit more meddling of the uh, director general in this process, have a serious consultation, first with the main use of dispute settlement, then with everybody, take his good offices a little bit more seriously and try to push a consensus towards improving the institutional dimension of dispute settlement and make sure that these guys act as agents more than as principals. If we make progress in those two areas, we believe that we have the makings to have a much, much better DSU. And I will stop here. Thank you very much, Petros. Um, I realized that I've actually forgotten the boring part of my introduction, which is the housekeeping rules. So the first thing I should tell you is you can ask questions by using the raise your hand button, which I think you should see. And when you do that, I'll 
uh, give you the floor to ask questions in this, this, this Q&A. The other thing that I should tell you is this is going to be recorded and going to be placed on YouTube. So if you're not happy with that, this is your moment to run. Um, but are there any questions for Petros? I don't see anyone raising their hand. Oh, but here's one coming through the chat function, which is also fine. Um, and Ignacio, uh, so, uh, and I get them on two channels. So to make this easier for me, please just stick to uh, raise your hand. There is a question uh, by Ignacio Bercero. So Ignacio, uh, please feel free to ask your question. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Petros. Uh, I just wanted to understand a little bit better the, the proposal that you have been making. You have been suggesting, if I understood, uh, a permanent panel body of 18 members selected uh, through a previous screening uh, process. How would this relate to the appellate body? I mean, are you basically talking about two-step dispute settlement or just a one-step uh, with the permanent panel body? Um, my second question is, you said in the beginning, and I very much agree, that the crisis of dispute settlement is not isolated from the broader crisis of the WTO, including uh, some issues relating to interpretation of uh, provisions on trade remedies. You are suggesting a solution which is just focused on the dispute settlement. How realistic do you think it is uh, to get a consensus on that basis? Okay. Just I didn't hear very well this, the last part of your second question before realistic. No, I the second question is you said in the beginning that uh, the crisis of dispute settlement is linked to a broader crisis in the WTO. I would argue that it's closely linked to a strong difference of views about the interpretation of certain rules relating to trade remedies. You have suggested a solution on dispute settlement, uh, which is basically centered just on improving the functioning of the dispute settlement. How far do you think that that is realistic, if I can be very plain, to get the US on board on that? <laughs> you have been, you cannot be more plain than that. Now, <laughs> let me start with the first point. The first point, you know, quite frankly, I think that the appellate body has much more of a function if you have 500 different panelists. If you have a permanent body of panelists, 15 people, Bernard and me, we see less the argument for the appellate body. Uh, but um, if you go for permanent panelists, what we would like to see is some sort of ordering of, let's say, importance of submitted disputes. That is, new cases, cases where I have no, uh, let's say, um, jurisprudence, they should go to the plenary. Cases where, quite frankly, I, I've dealt with this case. What matters most is not a question of one or two instances. The question is to have a very functioning, expertise-loaded dispute settlement system. We can live happily with a one-instance uh, system as long as this one-instance system is not what we see now. People who have never done WTO before being appointed panelists and then ask the secretary to write the report if we want to be totally frank. Now, on the second point, uh, how realistic this I cannot tell. I mean... Uh, like many people, I hope the Trump administration is out by November and then things change. <laughs> but uh, I think, look, I'm not a big fan of anti-dumping, as you know, but uh, I think the U.S. has a point when it says, I negotiated the standard and this standard has never been interpreted. Uh, what's going on here? I mean, uh, I'm not saying maybe if you ask me, we wrote a paper with Tom Proust a couple of years ago where we said zeroing under no matter what standard should always be legal. But that's my view. Who cares about my view? The point is, if you have negotiated something and you don't pay attention to it, of course, the judge is not acting as an, prince, as an agent. I think as a principal, so, ah, 17.6, I read it out. It becomes part of Article 31, 32. Why? I mean, isn't this what I... So I think the US, if... The, if they see something in this area, in contingent protection, they lose a big part of their arguments to oppose the appellate body 
being or blocking every appointment in the appellate body in the near future. I mean, they have to look for some different moral justification for their position, and that will be hard. In case you're wondering where you find this raise your hand button that I mentioned, um, when you click on in the menu on uh, the, the uh, other participants, um, a mini window should open in which at the bottom you see the possibility to raise your hand. Um, Ignacio, is there, I, I still see your, your image. Is there something you'd like to go back on? Because otherwise we've had a question by uh, Rob House. So um, then maybe we could come to his question and then, uh, yeah, if, if he's there, I don't see him. So in that I'm case, there is another question by Gerard. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. Oh, um, oh, yes, very good. Go ahead. Uh, I was hoping to use the chat box, but anyhow, I mean, I was just reacting to Petrus's notion that in, the, in, in a situation where there are different interpretations and, it, and somehow it would involve a difficult exercise um, to choose uh, between them, um, that this should, that somehow this should trigger the, if I understood correctly, the adjudicator more or less somehow throwing up their hands and deciding not, you know, to uh, follow through with the interpretation. And that seems to me at odds with customary international laws reflected in Vienna Convention 31 and 32, which give the interpreter, it seems to me, what is intended to be a comprehensive, uh, you know, set of tools, and indeed, 32 is worded in such a way as to clearly suggest that the drafters of the VCLT had turned their minds to a situation where the tools in 31 would produce ambiguity, and so um, I'm not um, uh, I'm not close to the argument or. Um, I'm not dogmatically opposed to or skeptical about the argument that 31 and 32 are inadequate in some way, but maybe the answer uh, to that is to address it by, you know, a lex specialis or to uh, consider some revision of, of 31 and 32, because I don't see how we could get around the problem of interpretation, and yet I, I, I fully take your point that in many instances, interpretation is an extremely difficult uh, exercise. Um, the other uh, point I was going to make very briefly is uh, I would in some sense not be unhappy, and uh, as, as someone who is a huge fan, has been a huge fan of the appellate body, creating the professionalization of panelists uh, in a way, off the or trading that for uh, you know, and and dropping the appellate body. Why? Because um, the incompetence of panelists leads to major screw ups, uh, not only in terms of legal interpretation, but facts and mixed uh, a, a fact, matters of mixed fact law. The appellate body can correct you know legal. Uh, uh, screw ups, but it can't correct factual ones. And uh, if you look at a lot of the more complex cases, it seems to me that the underlying um, sin or uh, error is really uh, connected to incompetent fact finding uh, by, um, by the panels, uh, which the appellate body is more or less left with having to uh, uh, you know, accept uh, in a way, um, and then you know, simply try and correct, correct the uh, the law. Uh, and and so I like this uh, proposal, and we might actually end up in a better place, uh, given that we already have a lot of appellate body case law that still has some kind of pre precedential or at least persuasive value. Uh, if we can get competent fact-finding because, um, as you point out, I mean, the people who've been, um, you know, doing these panels, not only are they, you know, don't they know the law in most instances, 
they also have had no uh, experience uh, in judicial or quasi-judicial fact-finding or, or the assessment of evidence in any professional context, in, in fact. And, and that would be an enormous step forward if we could have people who uh, are trained and, and, and comfortable with, with, with being triers of fact. All right. Um, I was wondering, in the interest of time, um, whether you could also collect the other question uh, by Geraldo quickly, and then maybe Petros, you can quickly come back to it, um, so, and then we move on to the next section. Is that maybe a possibility? In that case, sure. Geraldo, if if you like, this is um, your time to ask your question. Thank you very much. Uh, so my question is that there's an argument that it's not just that the appellate body is occasionally wrong, but that it tends to turn its interpretations into legal text, right? Uh, and, and sort of go on and in the future interpret its, its instead of interpreting the, the, the treaty uh, text, interpret its own previous interpretations and sort of consolidate them. Now, uh, this seems, uh, if I understand the US argument correctly, to be linked not only to the fact that the only the people who are there, but also to the structure where you have permanent people. So how does your system of permanent panelists, uh, do you seek to address this issue and to try to insert a, a, a mechanism for there to be uh, also the possibility of revirement uh, de jurisprudence, as the French call it, to have change in the jurisprudence uh, due to uh, new circumstances, new ideas? How do you make the system permeable rather than, uh, uh, let's say, frozen as the past body has been accused of being? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Petros. Okay. Uh, Rob, on the second point, we agree 100%. I mean, one thing that we've been discussing with Bernard for some time now is why the hell the US has not made the same fuss for panels? I mean, this is where the problems start. The problems start at the panel level. And there are dozens of reports that said black, white, and gray on the same issue. And very often, the appellate body has found it difficult to come up with one solution for all panels in the future or has been cryptical and subsequent panels had no gu enough guidance. That's why we believe that's where you start. You start at the panel level where facts, because facts are stubborn, facts matter, and facts are outside the preview of the appellate body. So on the second point, on the first point of 31, 32, you see, I'm a little bit, uh, I, I, I prefer to be pragmatic about those things. So what I did when we started discussing this point with Bernard, I checked the cases where the appellate body used negotiating history. There are less than a handful. Actually, there's only one case where they really used negotiating history. It is the Canada case concerning a concession in the farm goods from the 90s. So the appellate body thinks the negotiating history doesn't matter. Everything is crystal clear. And when you look at what the appellate body has said, it has said black, white, and gray on the same issue. Now forget details, big issues. I mean, this to me in and of itself, the appellate body jurisprudence in and of itself is evidence enough that very often there is not one interpretation. Why they didn't go to negotiating history, maybe they didn't want to outsource too much, I don't know, for the same reason maybe that panels never use the permanent group of experts in the subsidies agreement. They don't like outsourcing expertise and their competence. But I think that if you, even when you go to Article 32, and we did, uh, I did a lot with, for our paper with Bernard, on Article 17.6, if you look into art, thanks to a common friend of Bernard's and mine, Mark Cowlin, who sensitized me to this point, when you look at this discussion, it is not crystal clear what the US had in mind. It is not crystal clear that 17.6 is linked to anti-dumping only or never mind to zeroing, because they wanted to have this across all contingent protection instruments. So negotiating history very often is not as informative and yes, this could be the assumption of the drafters of the Vienna Convention, but quite frankly, to me, it's a very weak assumption because very often we end up with a word which we take it home. And I think in my common law perspective, how to understand it. And you think in your civil law, and the word cannot mean the same to both of us. What do you do in these cases? I don't think that it is, it makes sense to say that the judge should be entrusted ultimately with this responsibility to do essentially law to make law, because to me, the judge is always an agent that does not have this legitimacy. Now, on the point by Dr. Uh, uh, Geraldo, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of the way Supreme Court in the US has 
handled its uh, precedent. I'm a big fan of the way it has disagreed. In the overall, there are, of course, cases back against Bell I don't like, and maybe Jacob Bill is against Ohio, fine. But I mean, in the overwhelming majority of cases, when the Supreme Court of the US wanted to take distance from prior case law, either it points to distinguishing factors or it points to new theories. For example, the antitrust revolution in the 70s, 80s, how should we be dealing with vertical restraints following Stigler's work? Or, or they come up with something which is a very reasonable basis to take distance. That's what I expect to see from uh, the, if you get good people there, these good people will understand that you cannot take precedent lightheartedly. That precedent matters for a number of reasons. If you have people who don't care very much, who are not trained in thinking along those terms, as are the majority of the appellate body members, historically, I'm not saying everybody, there are some bright exceptions, very few. Well, you end up with what you end up. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I think now is the time to move on to the next session. So, uh, our next section, um, where we're going to talk about working practices. Um, obviously, any WTO reform requires political buy-in from WTO members. And one way to achieve this buy-in uh, if I in, is to make the organization more efficient and to ensure that it delivers. And uh, Bob Wolf has developed uh, some ideas on how working practices in WTO uh, committees can be rendered more efficient and effective. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks for this opportunity uh, to talk to such a distinguished group. I'm going to be into the plumbing more than the uh, high art of uh, Petro's presentation. Uh, We've been talking about WTO reform and reform of working practices for some time. Now it's happening in real time, and there are a number of things that are actually quite important in this crisis. Members need to keep, keep each other informed. That's the first part of my presentation. They need still to review the implementation of existing obligations. They need informal opportunities to share their experiences, and they need to um, coordinate their responses to the crisis. In the uh, conclusion of this, I will uh, talk about some things the General Counsel can do right now. So first off, uh, everybody knows that notifications uh, don't work very well in a lot of agreements. There are a lot of uh, lacunae. And now the Director General has called for enhanced notification of measures taken in response to the crisis. So this is something that, that needs attention. Uh, there is a proposal from the United States and others that says if you don't notify properly, uh, you're going to be punished. And if you think the reason for poor notification is bad faith, then that would make sense. But if the problem is a lack of capacity is one of the other possible explanations, then what's needed is technical assistance, not punishment. In any event, diagnosis is needed in each committee. Committees need to ask themselves whether the information that they get from the not notifications under their agreements is objectively inadequate for review of legal obligations, but also inadequate for understanding responses to the crisis, which is the big thing every committee should be worrying about at the moment. And the second question committees should ask is how can members provide the information that's needed in a way that lessens the burden, not increases it. Second part, conflict management. There's a basic proposition familiar in uh, many discussions of reform that specific trade concerns lead to clarification and even resolution of trade irritants before you even get into the dispute settlement system. The one thing we know is that the number of STCs dwarfs the number of disputes. Discussing trade concerns expeditiously could be especially important now. The trading system has been upended by the COVID-19 crisis. There are a lot of things going on that trading partners might find discriminatory. So being able to discuss those quickly could be very beneficial. So what's the problem from a working practices standpoint? Well, we surveyed how each committee deals with STCs, SPS and TBT obviously being the benchmark. Most committees have a basic review of notifications. Some have questions about notifications in their meetings, and a few have what you would call STCs. Every committee has minutes of its meetings, but some of those minutes are more detailed than others, so it's easier to find out what has been discussed. Some committees have one or more document series to record questions and answers, which can be very useful. Most committees don't have a searchable database so that you can go back and find the history of the discussion of an issue or find comparable issues that have been discussed in the past. And of course, here is in the dispute settlement system and the patterns are quite similar. 
the largest traders are the most extensive users, meaning the US and the EU, followed by Japan, Canada, China, to some extent. So when I think about the reform proposals, and I'll focus on the proposal led by the EU and others, the 777 proposal, there's, there's two things to think about. Will it increase the number of members who raise trade concerns? That is, will they make the process more accessible to members? And will they make the process more effective for everybody? First part of the uh, proposal is timelines for convening documents, which uh, could certainly facilitate the work of small Geneva delegations, very important, makes it easier to consult capitals. What's missing and which would be very useful would be annotated agendas. We have what's called an e-agenda now in the TBT committee, it makes it much easier uh, when you have an annotated agenda ahead of the meeting for everybody to understand why a, uh, an issue is up for discussion, especially if it's been up in the past. Second, how you consider trade concerns. The proposal encourages written questions and answers, which again can be very valuable if everybody poses their question in advance in writing. Uh, officials and capitals uh, then have a chance to prepare their answer. If they get their answer online in advance of the meeting, you can have an interaction without anybody having to come to Geneva and thereby expedite the, the process. And something like this could be even more important when physical participation in WCO meetings is constrained. The proposal sensibly says there should be an integrated database that has all WTO documents. In fact, everybody would have a, a TBT and it's integrated, it then makes it easy to see when one, an issue comes up in more than one committee and how it's been dealt with uh, in different committees. The developing countries are resistant to anything that might increase the burden on them. And so there's a proposal that if you have difficulty to respond or implement, you can request assistance from the WCO Secretariat, which is fine, but doesn't go far enough because developing countries also need help to know that they have a concern worth raising. This is a well-known problem in the uh, dispute settlement literature, how hard it is to know, uh, get enough information to raise a sensible dispute. And that's something where capitals need to help. One of the options, and there's a number of things that could be done, is improved technical assistance and training, which means that part of the Secretariat needs a bigger budget uh, and a mandate when normality returns, as we hope it will, to bring many more capital-based officials to Geneva, because it's when you come to a meeting and you understand how the process works, that you begin to see how to make better use of it. Third part uh, and the third paper that uh, we've done is on what are called thematic sessions. It's really important to have a policy dialogue in a committee to consider not the operational minutiae, but what's working well, what's not working, what's next that the committee should be thinking about. And if you have informal meetings, then you have the chance to hear from the stakeholders, the people who are using your agreement, including regulators, other international organizations, really important to try to bring in firms. And in the current context, being able to have informal meetings might be the best way to think about what the uh, uh, novel trade policy challenges are that are being posed by the crisis. So what's a thematic session? Well, it's a meeting sponsored by or associated with the WTO body in some way, but not part of its formal meetings. We found over 100 in the past uh, three years. They uh, have all sorts of names used for them. Nearly three quarters are simply sharing experiences informally in the operation of the agreement. Another quarter are on trade related issues that aren't being well addressed now in the WTO. And there's an interesting number of groups that actually have never held a thematic session and might. One of the proposals that we make is that there has to be a way to get uh, broader participation. Barely a third of capital based participation in these things now are from non G20 members. My suggestion is that the uh, General Counsel needs to establish a central budget uh, with appropriate criteria that committees can use to apply for funding. And then you have a thematic session back to back with a committee. You can bring in speakers from developing country capitals uh, who can participate in the thematic session, participate in the committee, and that's a great training opportunity when it's possible to bring people to Geneva. Video conferencing technology could increase participation across the board. And that, of course, would be especially important to, to do now. There's a suggestion from a think tank that the WTO should create a new committee on uh, crisis response that could certainly be done under the General Counsel's uh, responsibility. It would provide focus for work that's underway across WTO bodies and across the Secretariat, bringing that together in one place to look at what's happening in response to the crisis. It would ensure coordinated assessment of all the new measures and it 
could also create a consistent approach to raising specific trade concerns that would be relevant in the crisis. And all the uh, enhanced procedures that uh, I've suggested already today would be uh, very appropriate for this new committee to use. So what's needed? Uh, first, there are decisions that the general counsel could take and take right now. Every committee should be asked to review its notification obligations. We need the integrated database. That's a central decision. There ought to be a budget for uh, participation in regular meetings and thematic sessions. More support uh, for technology is happening on the fly, but it's important. And a new committee. There are guidelines from the general counsel that to some extent committees are responsible for their own procedures, but there should be advanced documentation and annotated agendas. Written questions and answers would make a big difference uh, to every committee and, and of course encouraging virtual participation in the work of the WTO is essential right now and could make a big dif difference in the future to uh, engaging more developing countries in the work of, um, the, uh, of the WTO. And I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, Bob. Um, so now we go over to the Q&A. Um, please, if you want to ask any questions, do so, but please do so concisely in the interest of time. And uh, ideally, please raise your hand using the use your hand button in the uh, participants uh, management list. I so far, don't see any hands raised, but um, we'll wait a few seconds. Um, Right, I think Bob, you have answered all the questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, if 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 there are any uh, questions on this specific part, we can of course come back to this uh, later. Um, oh, yeah, now I see a, a question. Um, there is a question by uh, Ho Lim. So please, the uh, floor is yours. Yeah. No. Thanks very much, uh, Christian. Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, not so much a question since we've been talking about these issues with Bob for some time now, but more to say that, you know, appreciate very much his work and the research that he's done looking at these different working practices. And just to mention that actually, in, in a way, COVID-19, I think you made that point as well, Bob, is, uh, is actually making it really interesting to see that how some of these working practices are being put to the test um, and they're actually being used and the e-agenda that you mentioned which was an online platform for members to actually submit their specific okay. trade concerns in advance of the meeting uh, is actually proving to be a really useful communication tool because uh, members can both submit their STCs and they can exchange comments on it and we'll be using it to experiment a little bit further to see how that could be used um, to support ongoing committee work in the absence of the ability to actually just to share say that and it's, it's quite an interesting time for us to see how we can further utilize and adapt the, the working procedures and this is this this is particularly in the tbt committee area so just wanted to add that comment thank you bob thanks so. thank you very much um I wonder, shall we collect a second question, which we would have from Dimitri before we go to you answering it? Uh, Dimitri, please go ahead. Thanks so much. And Rob, I think that's it's an excellent presentation and a lot of really practical advice on what the Secretariat can do on what I guess is the supply side of um, collecting STCs. But I was wondering if you had any ideas on what the Secretariat and I suppose the the members that are friends of the system could do more on the demand side. So to push right now, I think the lack of STCs can be explained in part by the difficulty in the system, but part as disengagement from industry. I think industry is not as a manner of, uh, as a matter of normal course, bringing to their trade ministries concerns to be raised in the relevant committee as often as any of us would like to see. So is there anything, given resource constraints and given to a Geneva-based organization, 
that the Secretariat, but also really supported members can do to, to boost that equation. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Um, and I think, I think, is my mic on? Yes, it is. Um, I thank Ho for uh, that information on what's actually going on. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, change is happening in real time. Uh, great question about what um, countries can do to help others who are not raising questions. It's really expensive to do the research to know that you have a uh, trade concern that's worth raising. One of the things that uh, is possible is uh, further adapting and pushing what's called the EPING system in SPS and TBT, which is where the Secretariat can push uh, new notifications out to firms that register to receive them, which means every country can start getting its firms to register for EPING, which means they receive uh, new information about what uh, is uh, happening in WTO. And that becomes a way to encourage firms to look at notifications by their trading partners to say, oh, that might actually cause me a problem and go to their own government and say, maybe this is something that's worth looking into. And in a quick response, I'm not sure there's anything else I could say. All right, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so unless I see you appearing any more hands, um, then I would suggest we move on to Bernard's presentation on open plurilateral agreements. Uh, one criticism you very much hear about the system is that uh, the practice of consensus is too restrictive and that more flexibility is needed. And uh, Bernard has some ideas about how this can be put in place. So I still don't see any other hands, so I would say, Bernard, the floor is yours. Bernard? Okay, yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, good, let me just... So I start with the OPA uh, debate. So this, this is based on joint work with uh, Chuck Sable at Columbia Law School, and it builds on papers that Petros and I wrote <clears throat> a few years ago. Essentially, um, and before I start, actually, I want to say it's quite amazing to have all of you on this particular Zoom meeting. I don't, I, if I think about how much it would cost to get all of us into one room together, I think the Bertels von Stiftung would have sticker shock. So I guess that's the plus side of this disaster we're living through. So you all know we have three types of um, agreements that are non-universal in the sense that we only have smaller groups of countries signing them. So one is your traditional trade agreement, preferential trade agreements, which are discriminatory. Essentially, it's all about liberalizing access to markets on a discriminatory basis. A number of the recent agreements go much further into designing rules in areas that are not covered by the WTO. But essentially the downside of these agreements is they lead to fragmentation. Uh, and largely that's because it's very hard to accede to existing trade agreements. The CPTPT is an, uh, is an exception, but that is very much an exception. Then of course we have the GPA, which is your kind of standard plurilateral agreement under the WTO, which is discriminatory or can be discriminatory, but which requires consensus to be included into the WTO. And we have what we call open plurilateral agreements uh, with no caps on the P and on the A, which are essentially critical mass agreements where countries decide to go and do something, which could be liberalization, but it also could be regulatory types of uh, commitments that they apply on a non-discriminatory basis. So we have currently four <clears throat> ongoing discussions in the WTO on e-commerce, on domestic regulation of services, investment facilitation and micro and medium small enterprises. And all of those are likely to be applied on a non-discriminatory basis simply because it's impossible to get the consensus you need to do anything on a discriminatory uh, basis. So the, the basic elements of these open plurilateral agreements and essentially what we argue in the paper is that this is not necessarily new for the WTO, but it is uh, an instrument that can actually help move WTO members forward uh, in a variety of different types of areas. 
So in a nutshell, it's essentially cooperation among a subset of WTO members. Reasons for doing that is not just because the WTO finds it increasingly difficult to agree to anything on the basis of consensus, but it's also, we argue in the papers that small group types of arrangements could actually be first best. So given that countries have very strong differences in social preferences in some areas, that they have very different priorities in terms of where they want to allocate and invest scarce resources, it makes sense to have a system where essentially groups of countries can move ahead and design rules or agree on how to cooperate in an area <clears throat> without that applying to everybody. The key thing for these agreements is the openness and openness really revolves around being open to additional participation by any WTO member, but also open in the sense of transparency and I'll come back uh, to that. These agreements may or may not constitute hard law, so they may or may not be enforceable, but even if they're not binding, that doesn't mean we're talking here about best endeavors type of language, right? So it's not just talk, it really is about trying to identify areas in which countries will do things jointly, work together, try and figure out how to solve particular problems, learn from each other. So <clears throat> it's, these things have to be substantive to be worth the effort. And of course, the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating, but that really is the presumption that we take when we think about what OPAs could actually do for the multilateral trading system. Non-discrimination is a key feature of these agreements, but what we stress in the paper that non-discrimination does not mean unconditionally extending them to any country, because quite frequently there is going to be conditionality in the sense that governments, countries will have to satisfy certain regulatory preconditions for cooperation to actually be feasible. If you think about what are the differences between these plurilateral agreements and traditional trade agreements is essentially what the OPAs allow countries to do is to take away the terms of trade rationale for a lot of why countries negotiate trade agreements, right? So in the trade economic literature, we have these terms of trade arguments or the terms of trade rationale for trade agreements. We have a commitment theory, which is closely related to these terms of trade rationale because agreements are self-enforcing. So you need to have some kind of a stick to induce sustained cooperation. So the, the upshot of this is that these things really revolve around market access. What OPAs allow countries to do is to deal with issues where market access is not really the key concern or where you don't really need to link market access to sustain uh, cooperation, right? And often that is going to revolve around dealing with market failures collectively. So those could be collective action problems that affect more than one country or potentially affect the whole world. Or it's issues that have to do with regulatory measures where it makes sense for countries to cooperate if they share, ultimately, they have the same objectives, they're looking to achieve the same outcome. So what these OPAs then allow us to do potentially is to foster cooperation, which will on the one hand reduce the costs for businesses to operate internationally, right? And that's what makes these things relevant for the trading system. But I think more importantly, they can be mechanisms to support cooperation between government agencies, between regulatory uh, agencies who are pursuing common goals. And again, those goals might have very little to do with market access but of course they might also be using market access as a tool to achieve a regulatory objective. So there are mechanisms to support that type of cooperation and at the same time, they're also vehicles potentially for countries to exchange uh, information on experience, learn from each other, and hopefully over time adapt and improve national policies that are geared towards achieving that common goal that, they, that the signatories all share. So much of the focus currently in terms of the joint statement initiatives that are ongoing in the WTO are really focusing on what I think could be called coordination failures or efforts to identify what makes for good regulatory practice. And I think this is really valuable. It's valuable in and of itself in the areas that are being considered. It's also really important, I think, for the sustainability and the future of the WTO, 
Uh, if none of these joint statement initiatives manage to come up with something meaningful, I think that will be another nail in the coffin <clears throat> of the WTO. So I'm very much hoping that they will succeed in delivering outcomes which are meaningful enough that we can sell them to uh, domestic parliaments. But I think one of the problems we confront is that the issues that are being discussed today, even though they're important, and I think they will generate significant economic benefits if successful, they're not really dealing with the big ticket items aside from maybe data, data privacy uh, in e-commerce with the sources of spillovers today. And if you just think about three that come up, at least in my mind, immediately, that's the whole subsidies agenda, which we'll come to uh, in a few minutes in the, next, in the next presentation. It's the use of trade policies to achieve uh, climate change, carbon reduction uh, goals under the Paris Agreement, where there really is going to be a link made with trade policy as an instrument. And what we're seeing today in real time uh, an example could be to deal with the use of export restrictions. Right, so these are all areas which are creating huge spillovers, uh, or at least huge potential spillovers on other countries and where the rules of the game are either full of holes or do not exist uh, <clears throat> and relieve a lot of discretion for governments to take the type of actions that they are taking. So necessary elements for actually doing more to harness the potential of open plurilateral agreements really revolve around a lot of what Bob Wolf uh, just spoke about, right? So that has to start with substantive evidence-based deliberations in a given policy area, right? And that might be done through existing WTO bodies committees along the lines of these thematic sessions that he uh, talked about and that are already ongoing. But the key issue here is to identify where are there policy areas that create large spillovers that are systemically important, right? So they're important for the trading system as opposed to just individual uh, countries or individual industries. And the focus should be on assessing approaches through which to attenuate such spillovers in ways that reflect differences in national priorities and capabilities, right? So we have a lot of heterogeneity among the WTO membership. And again, one reason for thinking about using OPAs as an instrument is because it allows countries to actually move in areas where they have similar priorities and where they have the capacity to push an agenda forward. In a lot of the areas that are creating tensions today, there's a real need for the trade community to work with other communities, other organizations that have either a mandate or a very strong interest in a governed policy area. And again, we've already seen this in the thematic sessions discussion, that is one way of bringing some of those interests into the WTO context. A good example, I think, and that we discuss a bit uh, in the paper, is uh, sector-specific climate clubs under the Paris Agreement, because that's already something which is happening, and clearly there's going to be an increasing interface with trade there, and I, it is much better for countries to actually agree on what the rules of the game might be under the umbrella of an open plurilateral agreement and to go off and define what the rules are going to be on a unilateral basis. And I think there's a serious threat of the unilateralism approach that dominating at the moment. Another example is to cooperate in terms of deciding how to engage and how to use export restrictions in emergency situations. So that goes a bit in the direction of this crisis committee. But I think this whole COVID 19 responses that we've seen countries take uh, using trade policy to me really illustrates how if we had had some OPAs to actually deal with some of these measures we would have been in a much better place. So the use of export restrictions is a good example. Uh, Andreas talked about sicken thy neighbor policies right but essentially this is negative sum type of behavior which is going to reduce the overall supply response and hinder ramping up of production of essential supplies, essentially because it ignores the fact that we have very interdependent economies, we have supply chains, we have firms that rely on being able to source inputs from all over the world. And if, every, if everyone willy-nilly starts to impose export restrictions on medical supply-related production, then essentially what you're doing is you're stopping all of that uh, trade from happening, which means you're also really impeding the ability to produce more of the supplies you need. 
Now, export restrictions, of course, are nothing new for the trading system. We've been around this particular bush in the food crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, it's very unlikely that governments are going to agree to disciplines on export controls, certainly not in emergency settings. Uh, that also has been something that has been tried in the WTO before uh, with no success. But I think where an OPA potentially could have done a lot to help was to put in place systems so that countries actually know what does supply capacity look like? Where can we quickly ramp it up? What are the bottlenecks? What are the constraints that inhibit ramping up of supply? So essentially just basic information on, on supply and demand balances, what's happening in terms of investment responses, coordinating on preparing for emergencies. So the forward looking dimension in terms of stocks and maintaining stocks. Uh, areas such as joint purchasing agreements, arrangements to get these essential supplies. So all you really need to do is to read the newspaper and you see lots of areas in which if there actually had been a framework to facilitate cooperation, we very well could have been in a much better place, both from a public health perspective and in terms of not distorting incentives for production and investment. So there are examples to build on here and we have a little bit of a discussion on this in some of the papers. One is the G20 information exchange system that wasn't put in place for food, food products, the AIMS uh, system, which I think is a good step to build in, to build on, but it's not a formal agreement. So again, that is also an example where we're seeing countries again use export restrictions for food, where if there had been an OPA uh, <clears throat> to actually guide that, it might have been, we might again have been in a somewhat bit better place than we are today. So preparing the ground uh, for these things, I think one of the things we argue, and I'll end with this, we argue in the paper is that there have been a lot of objections raised by uh, countries against uh, the increasing pursuit of plurilateral cooperation in the WTO. And I think the concerns that have been raised should be taken seriously. And I think a lot of those concerns can be addressed by proponents of these plurilateral agreements actually agreeing to a set of principles. So that could result in a reference paper along the lines of what we have in basic telecommunications, but essentially it should set a number of, of uh, basically uh, measures that participants agree to take, which will address a lot of the concerns that, that countries have that are not participating in these agreements and maybe don't want to participate at the moment. So one is that it has to be explicitly clear that this is voluntary. Nobody can be forced to join one. Maybe obvious, but I think it's good to, to, to formalize this, that any OPA has to be open to subsequent accession by any WTO member. That OPA should specify what the requirements are for accession. That there's a commitment that countries that accede to an OPA will not be subject to terms that are more stringent than those that apply to members where feasible, give consideration to a stepwise approach to compliance in those instances where the capacity doesn't exist yet in a country, but has to be strengthened or built up. Binding commitments to provide assistance to countries that need it, uh, but that are not yet in a position to satisfy the regulatory preconditions. And again, this is gonna depend a lot, of course, on what the subject matter of an open plurilateral agreement is. Consultation and conflict resolution mechanisms for countries that are seeking accession uh, in instances where the members actually do impose more stringent conditions or do not respond to requests to provide assistance uh, to non-members. And last but certainly not least, um, <clears throat> transparency measurement measures to ensure that outsiders actually know what is going on in the context of implementing an open plurilateral agreement, right? And here we can just draw on existing provisions in the WTO that pertain to publication of information uh, on measures that are covered by an agreement, robust notification requirements for members, regular engagement in terms of how the agreement is working, which is open to non-members, and annual reporting to the WTO General Council on the activities. So I'm sure, given all the people on the call, that you can come up with other things that you would like to put into this. So this is very much kind of an initial set of uh, principles that we came up with. Um, but we do think it's important to create a framework to actually guide and to govern uh, what OPAs 
should be doing in the WTO in terms of encouraging additional membership over time and dealing with, with concerns that especially developing countries might have in terms of acceding to them uh, down the road. Thanks. Thank you, Bernard. Any questions? I'll wait a few minutes to see if anyone is looking for that raise your hand button, which unfortunately can be a bit hidden, but it's in the participants menu. Yes, there is one from uh, someone that's identified as Alan's iPad. Please go ahead. I'm not sure why that uh, is calling me Alan's iPad. Alan Wolf of the WTO and uh, very happy to join you today and to listen to this uh, very good conversation. Uh, uh, I would add on the OPA list uh, in the present uh, coronavirus uh, situation, uh, which uh, Sabina Viand has raised, uh, the degree of government involvement that has to be backed off uh, or regulated. Uh, this includes uh, preemptive purchasing, it includes uh, preemptive investments. Uh, there's a, just a series of other forms of government involvement beyond export restrictions, which have exactly the same effect as an export restriction that uh, would be worth uh, broadening the inquiry to. But uh, I thought this was a, a very good discussion. I uh, welcome it. Thank you very much. Um, we have already quite a few questions, so I think the best course of action is if we collect a few. Uh, so, uh, Patrick Lowe, do you want to go next? Yeah, thanks. I think um, I find Bernard's paper really interesting and, and pretty thorough, but I have one, qu one question for clarification. When you talk about a distinction between non-binding OPAs and, and not being like Best Endeavours OPAs, is there something more here than simply a question of determination of commitment. Uh, is there any element of this that impinges on justice ability of in and of itself? Because I, I, it seems to me that it, it, you know when you say non-binding doesn't mean best endeavours. Um, you're just really talking about the frame of mind. But I'd, you know, I'm happy to be corrected. Okay. Um, there's also another question by Vishnu Desgupta, so we'll collect this, this one too, and then Bernard, I'll give you the opportunity to reply. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Hochman, uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, they are, uh, one of them is similar to the one uh, Mr. Patrick raised. Uh, my first question is the um, the um, non-discriminatory uh, part of the uh, open plurilateral agreements, as in when a new country decides to join, it will join on uh, existing, uh, the, it will join on the same requirements the, or, the original countries joined. Now, is there any history in uh, the WTO that allows for this? Because from my understanding, the existing plurilateral agreements, some of them have additional requirements for a new country. And in some, like a country can join on the existing uh, basis. And a, a, my second question is, would these, um, sorry if I missed it, if it was in the presentation, would these open plurilateral agreements have SNDT feature? Uh, and a, uh, my third question is the uh, criteria for uh, letting them join. Would it, would it be uh, some uh, like uh, objective criteria uh, such as data points as in when a country graduates out of an LDC, there are certain economic parameters it has to meet, which can't be disputed. Like, will it be something similar uh, uh, for uh, when uh, joining uh, these agreements. Okay, Bernard? <clears throat> okay, so let me, I'm on, right? Yeah. So on, on Alan's point, I think that's an excellent point. We just wrote a paper that actually makes that point, and it's, it's very interesting that even in the context of the European Union, where, you know, we have, 
a common market. We have, of course, a common external, a common commercial policy. And even if you were to say, no export controls at all allowed within Europe, right? Just think only about Europe. That still isn't going to get you to where you need to be because you can just requisition things, right? And there's nothing in the European treaty that says thou shalt not nationalize, uh, you know, so governments are essentially still very much sovereign. So I agree very much that that has to be part uh, of the equation. And in fact, that's really what's been happening mostly. It's where governments are actually requisitioning supplies or even consignments that are being, that are in transit through their country and that were not even produced uh, in the country. On Patrick's point, uh, good, that's a, I think a very good question. And I think it, we need to separate two things. So when I was saying non-binding best endeavors, that's really a function of the agreement, right? So if we have agreements that are meaningful in the sense that governments are making binding commitments to each other and other countries want to join in, that's where I think these principles are really important. If we have an open plurilateral agreement that is essentially just a coordination device where countries are essentially engaging in exchange of information on what makes sense. So I think investment facilitation would be a good example of that. A lot of these principles that we have really are not needed at all, right? So essentially we don't need to worry about justiciability. We don't really need to worry about enforcement. This is really just about, does this make sense for countries to participate in? If they don't, they don't, you know, no big deal. But there's nothing there that you need to worry about in terms of giving technical assistance, ensuring that regulatory agencies are up to snuff, et cetera. So I think it depends a lot on the type of agreement we're talking about. And I probably skated over that way too fast because of the lack of time. On the other questions, um, there aren't very many of these agreements in the WTO because to the extent we have open plurilateral agreements in the WTO, they're mostly on market access, right? So the ITA would be a good example. A bunch of countries simply decide to reduce tariffs and they apply that to everybody on an MFN basis. I think the, the, the main example we have today is the reference paper in uh, basic telecommunications. And there again, that's just a set set of principles. And I don't think there have been any instances, and I don't really see how you could do it because it's not an OPA in the sense that there's a committee that decides when you can actually sign the paper, you sign the paper or you don't sign the paper. I think where we have these problems and I think where some of the problems come from where countries are concerned about being held to a higher standard than incumbents is actually more in the process of WTO accession generally. Right, so where we've had instances where countries that are newcomers, who are kind of knocking on the door, are being asked to do things that no incumbent was ever asked to do. And I think that's partly what is informing those who argue that this is something to worry about. There's no special and differential treatment in terms of the way we envisage these agreements, because we would argue that these agreements really are about governments deciding to cooperate in a particular area doing things that they think make sense, that they've agreed with each other to do. And the only area where I see a parallel to the special and differential treatment provisions that we have today is there has to be assistance for countries to join those agreements if they cannot meet the criteria, the regulatory standards that apply in, in a particular agreement. So I think that also takes care of your third question. So I think this is really a way of, of rethinking also special and differential treatment and really focusing on the substance as opposed to building it in. I would argue building it in from the start into OPAs is simply a recipe for replicating the mess we have got, a, we have got ourselves in in the WTO um, on this. Thanks. Right, thank you very much. We are already a little bit behind schedule, so um... I would suggest we move on to the next section, which will be discussing industrial subsidies, which uh, are, of course, a huge bone of contention in trade politics. And Bernard has some more ideas to share on this. So Bernard, if you want to go ahead. In case you weren't able to ask your question, you can, of course, send an email to, to Bernard or to, to me, and we'll see uh, that we get an answer to you. But for now, let's talk about industrial subsidies. <laughs> 
Okay, so as was the case for uh, the previous sessions, this is more than just one paper. And, and Christian will circulate at the end of the webinar a, uh, <clears throat> an email with links to all of the papers. But so this is work that has been done with uh, Doug Nelson and with Bob Wolf again. <coughs> and I will try and go through this quickly. I think we all know, uh, for anybody who has read the Global Trade Alert, which monitors uh, developments in terms of what governments are doing in terms of trade policy. The one thing that is very clear from that monitoring exercise is that subsidies are really dominating what governments have been doing since the financial crisis, right? And partly that's because of the financial crisis. Uh, so this was one way of uh, stimulating economic activity, keeping things going. Of course, now in the current COVID-19 situation we're in, the use of subsidies is going to go up by another order of magnitude, probably. So this is really where the action is, right? So although there's been a lot of talk about tariffs uh, in recent years, certainly since the election of Mr. Trump, uh, if you look at what is happening around the world, it's very much a subsidy story. And that's partly production subsidies. It's partly measures to support exports, right? So this is where export-import banks, guarantees, development finance organizations, there's a lot going on there. So given that that is where the action is, and so where the papers start off is to say, okay, this is really causing a significant or potentially significant spillovers, right? And a lot of, of course, what is going on today and what is motivating a lot of the uh, attention that is being given to industrial subsidies is China. And what we argue in the paper is clearly China is a factor in this, in this discussion. And there has to be an effort made to accommodate China as a systemic power. And that's simply something which is unavoidable. But this is something that cuts across pretty much everybody, right? So there's really a general need here to revisit rules on subsidies, given that everybody seems to be using subsidies more and more. But also there's a need to revisit the rules because it's not that subsidies are necessarily bad, right? So we do have very good rationales for subsidy type policies. They need to be used or they can be the most efficient tool to address market failures. There are equity objectives that governments might pursue that, that call for the use of subsidies. So there is a balancing act to be done here in terms of dealing with the competitive effects of subsidies, which again is a general issue, and the fact that increasingly subsidies are being used more and more to achieve either non-economic objectives or economic objectives in an efficient way. So the current rules in the WTO were developed over 30 years ago. Now the WTO traditionally has focused primarily on agriculture when it comes to subsidy policies. And what we argue in the papers is that there's a real need to adjust these rules, both to reflect the rise of China, but also to reflect the changes in the world economy, in particular the rise of value chain production, specialization, and to reflect the fact that countries confront common problems which are going to call for tax subsidy type instruments to address them, right? And climate change here and then reducing carbon content of production is of course the major example here. So the premises we have in the, in the papers, a number of premises is that you have to take as given that governments have legitimate rationales to intervene uh, you get that out of any economic textbook, trying to impose changes in national economic systems. So telling China they should become um, a very different type of economy are bound to fail, uh, simply because you know, the target of that particular discussion is a very large economy. We're going to have to think about this in terms of variable geometry, in the sense that it, this does require an agreement between the major players, between the United States, China, the EU, large countries, um, that are both the cause of the spillovers and that the only way we're going to internalize these spillovers if all of those countries are part of an agreement, that effort should focus on those areas where there really are serious negative systemic spillovers. So we need, we need to focus on things that matter, that really move the needle, and that doing this calls for greater use of economic tools and analysis, right? And here I'm coming back again to a similar type of argument we had in the paper with Petros, 
is a, a theme of, of these papers is that we really need to move away from a simply legalistic hard law type of an approach towards addressing subsidies to one that recognizes that whether we like it or not, there is on the one hand, on the other hand, there is a balancing equation to be made here that we need to consider why governments actually use uh, subsidies and what the goals are for subsidies. And the final kind of element that we argue in the papers is that in the short term, it seems unlikely we're going to be able to agree on binding rules. So we really should be focusing on process, on developing informal disciplines, information, dialogue, and that can help move things forward, right? So <clears throat> we draw a lot in the paper on kind of basic, what we call rules of thumb from the theory of economic policy which really tries to identify what a subsidy should be dealing with. So in that theory, subsidy should be dealing with the market failures. There should be, we need to understand what the particular goal is of a subsidy, and we need to establish to what extent that subsidy creates uh, trade spillovers, right? And what we argue is that there's a real need to distinguish in terms of competitive spillovers between policies that address global collective action problems, versus kind of standard industrial policies where it's really all about <clears throat> developing a particular industry. There isn't necessarily a global a spillover and therefore we need to think about these things in different ways. We also make the point that this is not new ground for the WTO. Uh, there's, there's really nothing new here at all. So this discussion was already had during the Uruguay round. There was an initial time limited effort in the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures to include a category of non-actionable subsidies. This expired in 1999. And what we argue in the paper is that this was actually going in the right direction, but it was too narrow. And it really didn't distinguish subsidies that address global market failures from those that do not. So in a sense, what we're, what we're arguing in the paper is that we need to move towards something closer to the system that we have in the European Union, where there is a block exemption for certain types of subsidies. And we take those subsidies as uh, legitimate and therefore, uh, yes, they can create spillovers, but the presumption is that those subsidies create less of a problem than other types of subsidies. So what we need then are diagnostics, um, and I'll just skip this, but we really need to kind of do much more analysis on trying to assess where those spillovers really do create uh, systemic difficulties uh, that has to take into account the structure of particular markets, and industries. And there's a, an analogy that we draw in the paper between thinking about rules for subsidies and what was done in the area of competition policy, where again, there was a big shift over time from a purely legalistic approach towards one where this really a law and economics approach towards figuring out how to govern uh, market competition and apply competition policy rules. The information base on subsidies is very weak. And the main argument we make in the paper here is we really need to do much more of an effort to create that information base, to use indicators <clears throat> to actually assess and monitor what is happening with respect to uh, subsidy policies. And we argue that this is one area that actually lends itself to a plurilateral approach. And that what we need is to bring together the stakeholders in terms of the people who either pay the subsidies, so ministries of finance, or the ones who look at the effects of those types of measures. So think about national competition agencies and DG competition in the EU with international ex organizations that have the expertise to actually do the type of analysis that needs to be done to figure out what the incidence is of particular subsidy programs. That requires an institutional focal point, And this is something where I think we can certainly have a discussion where that should be done. The WTO is the obvious candidate, but it's also obviously very constrained in its ability to do the type of analysis that needs to be done. So <clears throat> that leads you pretty quickly to the G20 and the Trade and Investment Working Group as one institutional uh, mechanism where the relevant international organizations are sitting around the table with the major countries in the world economy that need to agree on this. So that would be one vehicle for moving this kind of work program and agenda on subsidies forward. So that's essentially what we argue <coughs> in conclusion in terms of where to go. Uh, and I don't have time to go into this, so I'm just gonna skip over this. 
but it really we need to have and establish a work program which probably should be plurilateral probably should be anchored on the g20 where we actually figure out what are the facts where do uh, policy programs actually create large spillovers and essentially start doing something along the lines of what was done in the context of the global fo global forum on steel excess capacity and what we argue in the paper there are lessons to be learned from that forum uh, so on the positive side that forum brought together china the european union um, and the united states uh, and they actually engaged with each other for three years in terms of providing information on capacity linking up with the private sector uh, that actually gave them a lot of information on terms of what is actually going on but <clears throat> but on the other hand what was not done in that forum is that really it wasn't complemented by analysis to kind of put numbers on how large are the spillovers that are actually being created what is the incidence and we can talk about why that was the case but <clears throat> I think that's a model that we can kind of should revisit and learn the lessons as to what went right and what went wrong with that particular exercise in cooperation. I think the current COVID situation kind of makes that even more urgent to actually do this mapping exercise to have the information available in terms of what countries are doing. So that's certainly something that will be part uh, of this equation and it might actually help foster the political engagement you need to actually set something like this up because clearly the COVID response is an order of magnitude, I think, bigger than anything we've seen so far. So this is going to be with us uh, for quite a while. And there's going to be a lot of concerns as we exit out of the situation in terms of how do you do that and how do you actually identify what was really crisis response and what is essentially policies which really are going to be creating competitive uh, spillovers. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Bernard. Um, any questions for Bernard on the industrial subsidies part? Yes, there is a hand raised by Ron. Please go ahead, Ron, if you like. Or now it seems to have disappeared. Um, well, in this case, Sorry, uh, Rudolf yeah. asked, uh, raise his hand physically. I can see him on the, my screen. Oh, I, 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 we have more than 100 participants, so I can't see you all. But uh, please go ahead. <laughs> and you have to put on the microphone, otherwise. Um, Rudolf. Gerardo, I think you had a question. It's fine for you to go ahead. We have no hands raised, so please go ahead. Now it's Rudolf. Okay. Oh, go, go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> now it's similar, a very simple question. The whole subsidy discussion revolves around subsidies in manufacturing and possibly agriculture. Why not services? Why services beyond the screen? Even given the fact that the subsidy disciplines under the GATS are extremely weak. There are national treatment and MFN treatment, export subsidies and so on. If they are MFN and national treatment based are admissible in services, but it play, plays no role in discussions. Also subsidies, are the preferred area of gets minus commitments in PTA. So governments try to avoid even the national treatment obligations for subsidies they have undertaken under the GATS in their preferential trade agreements. Why is all that ignored in current discussions? Mm -hmm. Gerald, do you want to attach your question to this and then we hear from Bernard? No, actually my point was that uh, Rudolf had a question, but now since I'm here, oh. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I, I, I might want to ask. So, I mean, it's it's nice to say to speak of of, of non-legalistic approaches, but uh, what do you mean by that? Because it can mean two different things, right? It can mean either that the contr controlling criterion is not a legal norm as we normally understand it, but an economic standard, but it can also mean that there's a political decision being made, and in that case, you need someone to be making this political decision. So, I wonder what you mean by this non-legalistic approach, because also as as the GATT uh, panelists. Uh, found out quickly, if you have a non-legalistic approach and then you have a dispute, suddenly it becomes a legalistic approach, right? Thank you. Okay. Bernard? Okay, um, <clears throat> so Rolf, excellent uh, question. I mean, two minds how to answer it. Um, on the one hand, you don't want to wake up Mr. Trump uh, and say, you know, there is this thing called services, which we can also go after. Um, 
less facetiously. I think the reason is, is that partly because a lot of this, I think it's uh, a lot of the subsidies in the services context uh, have to do with particular sectors where this is kind of considered to be, you know, the normal way of operating, right? So partly it ties into kind of public, uh, public service type of, of sectors where there's a sense that this is something that needs to be done. Um, partly it's tied to the difficulty of disentangling uh, subsidies that are given to sectors because of, let's say, the financial crisis, right? So what was done with the financial system, with the banking system. Uh, but I completely agree with your with your take. So I, I shouldn't be interpreted as saying we only focus on manufacturing, we only focus on industrial subsidies, because in fact a lot of the subsidies that go to industry are in fact services subsidies, right? So in a sense, what we're doing is they're subsidizing inputs that are intangible inputs that are services inputs into production. So I think this is really one of the things we argue. You need to take a a, uh, a cross sectoral view of this and not, not be limited by just uh, industry, however we define industry. On, on non-legalistic, what I was getting at is essentially to make the argument that we need to consider both what governments are trying to do with those subsidies, and partly that could be done through the design of rules, but I think it's, it's important before we get there to actually do much more in the way of economic analysis as to what governments are trying to do and what the effects are of what they are doing, right? So in that sense, uh, that's my, um, that's what I meant with non-legalistic as opposed to saying, there's a rule that says thou shalt not do X, therefore we're going to go after you, independent of what we're trying to achieve, independent of how large the spillover might be. And I think what we, what we argue in the paper is that we need to focus much more on areas where those spillovers are actually large, significant, systemic, and that's where the focus should be. And a lot of the rest can just be left to happen because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter a lot for the trading system. And currently we really don't have a regime aside from how much it costs to bring a dispute that acts as a disciplining device against bringing cases in areas where at the end of the day, it's not really particularly uh, meaningful from a, from a spillover point of view. All right. Thank you very much. Um, since we've already used up a little more time than uh, we thought we would, I think we are going to wrap up here. Um, Andreas Escher wanted to say a few uh, farewell and thank you words. But uh, before I give the floor to him, um, I would like to draw your attention again uh, to what I have showed you earlier in my script. Uh, presentation where you can find afterwards the, the recording of this webinar, uh, which will be here on the getprojectwebsite.com. And this will be a specific dedicated website where you also have all the papers that we've been discussing today. Um, so I hope that uh, that will be a valuable resource to you. So thank you very much to all our participants and to all our panelists today. I really enjoyed this discussion. I learned a lot. Uh, despite it sometimes being a bit difficult to manage the technical side of a webinar as well as moderating it. Um, but to me, this was a very enjoyable experience and I hope it was for you too. And with that, over to Andreas. Yeah, short final, final words, I hope. Um, I, have a, I have an echo, but now it's gone. Okay, fine. Um, I pointed to, uh, to our to, um, the need for improvement in my, my initial statement. Uh, and what we heard over the last one and one and a half hours is that there are quite a number of very good ideas for improvement. Is any of this going to be easy? Um, obviously not. Um, whether it is uh, the, the professionalization uh, of uh, DSU panels, not easy. Whether it's the rather innocent looking uh, working practices, uh, which would result in, in quite a shift of, of uh, task for these parts of the Secretariat, definitely not easy. Um, whether it's um, um, the open plurilaterals um, and the way how they deal with the deeply rooted uh, S&D principles in large parts of uh, the membership are probably not easy, uh, uh, maybe theoretically, but in practice difficult. Whether it's uh, finally the, the mapping the diagnosis of the subsidies and, and how to put this in practice, 
uh, and to, to be agreed by everyone, not easy. So not easy. Uh, does this allow for not doing anything? Uh, definitely not. Uh, I think uh, the, the, you again made the case that it is important, that it is necessary, and I hope that this contributes at least uh, a little. Um, I can see that uh, th there's, a, there's a kind of a law that says um, uh, that uh, a webinar should last less than an hour because otherwise people would drop out. You did not. So we still have more than 100 people present. So that says something uh, about, uh, about uh, the, the content presented by uh, those uh, three distinguished experts, uh, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and thanks to all of you. Um, for being here. Now, Bernard was raising uh, the fact that um, doing something like this um, uh, is, 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 a, is a great experience. Uh, there's a, a notion saying that we won't return to normal once this crisis is over. And, and with regard to this kind of thing, webinar kind of gathering like we have it today, I, I promise we won't go back to normal uh, because I think it's really a perfect way to bring excellent people together in a short period of time and, and produce knowledge. So thanks a lot. Um, we count on you next time and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>